Heaven sent. Let's be real for a second. People love crime. Let me rephrase that. People love doing things they aren't supposed to. Don't you agree? But when it comes to video games, people love the idea of acting out their wildest and most insane fantasies in a virtual playground as they're able to do as they wish without the risk of actual harm or consequence. It's built into all of us. We're curious about the intrusive thoughts that live in our brains because we know it's a place our mind isn't supposed to wonder. And when that curiosity gets the best of us, luckily we have a wide array of video games at which we can indulge in these cravings of debauchery. Now when it comes to the subject of crime and gaming, it's a no-brainer that the Grand Theft Auto series is the greatest example of how popular this type of subject matter is in our society. And this argument is even further supported by the fact that the GTA series is the fifth highest selling gaming franchise of all time, with GTA 5 being the second highest selling video game ever. But there once came a time where crime-based games were only just beginning to make their presence known in the industry, and the catalyst being with the massive release of Grand Theft Auto 3 on October 22, 2001. The world had never seen such freedom in a video game before, and as I had talked about in my previous Kane and Lynch video, GTA 3 was the Pandora's box for the industry standard of what gamers wanted and craved in the early 2000s. The foul language, crude humor, and excessive violence, it was every parent's nightmare. But as we said before, the curiosity got the best of us, and it was impossible for the industry to resist that this type of content is exactly what was going to sell. And just like how live service games have become the trending product in present day gaming, back then, it was all about crime, baby. And with an insane amount of development studios looking to ride the coattails of GTA's success, the trend of crime-based games were more than plentiful in the early 2000s. And being the absolute degenerate that I was back in the day, I happen to have both a good amount of knowledge and past experience with a fair bit of these titles. So for this video, I thought we would take a look into some of the more obscure crime titles of the early 2000s, just to see how crazy some of these developers went in terms of shock value and pure unadulterated garbage. This was a time when everybody was looking for their perfect heist, but other than GTA, could there have been a better franchise? Well, let's find out. Going back to the infant stages of online console gaming, the Xbox was the supreme ruler in terms of player base and multiplayer classics. You had Halo Combat Evolved, Project Gotham Racing 2, and Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six 3 all making their marks on the world of Xbox Live and its steadily growing player count. And with the Xbox original including a built-in Ethernet port, it was a no-brainer that it was leading the charge for this online revolution. The PS2 was a bit behind in terms of online play, as Sony had made it much less convenient with the need of an expansion bay, as well as an adapter startup disk being required to connect to the internet. The Sony had its sights set on making change for its consumers, and knew they were going to have to create their own IP to answer to the early 2000s online revolution. This solution came with the inception of the SOCOM series. SOCOM US Navy SEALs was a 2002 PlayStation exclusive, it made use of voice commands and squad-based tactics to give its players an immersive gaming experience. And while it was one of the more innovative games in terms of voice recognition, SOCOM was more so left for its incredible online support. The game included one of the very first models of the PlayStation headset, giving its players an opportunity to communicate with teammates from all over the world and further immerse themselves into this tactical-based shooter. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the first game on our list was heavily inspired by the likes of SOCOM, but was it equally impactful to the gaming community? Not even close. 25 to Life, a game that was developed by both Avalanche Software and Ritual Entertainment, as well as published by IDOS, was a crime-based third-person shooter released on January 17th, 2002. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of press or really any kind of exposure for this game's release, so it's kind of difficult to dig up any information on the development of 25 to Life. But from what I gather in the limited trailers and online articles dating back to 2004 to 2005, they were aiming to make a game that was a combination of both SOCOM meets Grand Theft Auto. And did they achieve their goal? Not quite. Now while this game may have thrived much more in an online setting, I decided to set up an emulation copy and play through the story mode for a better look into this game's world. And from what I can tell, the game is having an identity crisis. 
Now right from the jump, we're thrown into one of the most try-hard, awkward, low-down, terribly scripted intro cutscenes I've ever seen. So where you been? You smell like sticky, icky, ooey. You been hanging out with that asshole Sean again? The dialogue seems like it was written by B-Rag Gluckman from Malibu's Most Wanted. Don't be hating. Now I'm all for cheesy dialogue and B-movie style scripts, but this game feels like it has no soul when it comes to its cutscenes. It more so felt like the writers were giving their best guess on how their characters should act, and in turn, it only comes across like they were trying too hard. But anyways, 25 to Life begins with the starting protagonist Freeze, arriving home from a long day of busting caps and greets his family at the door. His wife confronts him about his life of crime and tells him he needs to be a better influence on their son. Freeze agrees to turn his own- That's- Wow, that's- Yeah. That's a tongue twister. Breeze agrees to turn over a new leaf, but first must run it by his partner in crime, Sean. Sean isn't too happy about his new leaf, but agrees to let Freeze off the hook if he can handle one last narcotics deal. Freeze agrees to this deal, which ends up being a setup from the DEA, and is now in a gunfight for his life and freedom. This is where our gameplay begins, and where I slowly began to lose my sanity in its incredibly difficult control schemes. This is one of those games that just did not age well, as the aiming is incredibly finicky and will make it very difficult for you to hit your target. Now this game was also released for the PC, which is probably much more enjoyable with mouse and key, but as for the PS2 version, which I use for the video, it's not great. Now despite all the hate I've been dishing out for this game so far, you'd be surprised to hear that I still found myself enjoying it at times. Throughout each level, you'll be giving multiple objectives as well as side quests, Upon completing these side objectives, it rewards you with cosmetic items for customizing your online character, which is pretty cool. The game also features a fully licensed soundtrack, featuring many legendary hip-hop artists such as DMX, Tupac, and Ghostface Killa. I also really enjoyed the gritty and atmospheric level design for each map. Even though the graphics were a bit dated for their time, I still felt that the levels such as the apartment complex did a great job of putting you in the mood for some gun blazing action. Now the game is highly repetitive. You will find yourself running on mostly linear paths, gunning down enemies, and picking up weapons and health along the way. Your main objective is usually just making your way through each level, but occasionally you'll find yourself hunting for a stash or something similar. I should also note that the story mode also follows along two more characters other than Freeze. You're also given the chance to play police officer Lester Williams as he aims to put a stop to the crime wave in the city and eventually you also get to control Freeze's right hand man, Sean. The game will take you through multiple goon infested locales and features over 50 weapons to toy with, and combining all these features with an overall solid soundtrack can really make up for the game's poor writing and voice acting. But overall, as much as this game wanted to take a GTA influence and create something equally as captivating, it definitely fell short in that aspect. But as far as its SOCOM-esque gameplay and reportedly decent multiplayer modes, I have to give this game its flowers for being ambitious at the very least. But we've got a lot more to cover, so don't touch that button just yet. Our next game is definitely one for the books. So get your street clothes on, cause we're about to go undercover in Midway's NARC on the PS2. Taking things back to the neon clad year of 1988, one of the most controversial video games of the late 80s was released in both the arcades and the NES. NARC was a side-scrolling run-and-gun shooter in which you play as two undercover agents sent to track down and eliminate the head honcho of a smuggling operation. Your character is equipped with both a machine gun and a missile launcher, with optional ability to arrest certain enemies for bonus points. It was one of the very first games to include excessive blood and gore, and also ruffled many feathers due to its copious amount of drug-related content. But after achieving an overall positive reception on the arcade release, it was later redeveloped by Rare Entertainment and released on the NES for at-home enjoyment. Albeit, most of the drug references had to be removed due to Nintendo's intolerance for such content. But anywho, after a good 15 years, none other than Midway Games decided to bring NARC into the new millennium with a fresh coat of paint and a new bag of powder, if you catch my drift. In this reimagining, you play as two different characters, 
one being narcotics detective Jack Vorzinski, and the other, a DEA agent by the name of Marcus Hill. Both of these fine gentlemen are under the orders of a police chief with a less than admirable stance on getting the job done, and will guide you through the many dysfunctional and corrupt ways of the police force in your city. As both characters you take on the role of an undercover cop, sent to clean up the streets of its dealers, as well as finding the person responsible for sourcing the latest drug on the streets, by the name of Liquid Soul. Our first encounter with this drug is in the intro cutscene, in which a downed suspect is able to revive himself with a shot of the drug, causing him to be somewhat invincible and almost wipe out an entire squad of policemen. This is obviously a massive problem for the city, and becomes the number one priority for our characters to stop its distribution. Your search will lead you to the streets of both Asia and America, with linear-based cityscapes to explore and navigate throughout your investigation. You can shake down other dealers for information, rid them of their stash, and turn it in for a higher badge rating. Or if you're more of a wild card, just keep it for yourself. Now that's awesome. Now badge rating is determined by how well you do your job. So if you're looking to clean these filthy streets and join the war on drugs, you're going to climb the higher badge rating hierarchy. But raising this stat doesn't even really do anything to be honest. There's really no perks for being a good cop. But when you do the wrong thing, this causes your rating to slip, which can lead to you being demoted from your undercover position and even being kicked off the force. Once you're off the force, any use of a weapon becomes an illegal act, and now the people you once called your brothers will be trying to take you down. Other mischievous acts such as confiscating drugs for personal gain can be done as well. You can keep the drugs for yourself, sell them for a profit, or just take them. Like, actually do the drugs. What? Each drug has its own unique effect on the player and will either enhance or be a detriment to your combat ability. Frequent use of these substances will also cause your character to become addicted, meaning you'll either have to keep tracking down your fix or you have to fight off the scaries and night sweats until you're clean again. It's a for sure interesting game mechanic, but it doesn't really add much to the overall enjoyment of the game. While it is an incredibly unique title, I have to say it's lacking in certain departments. As I previously mentioned, you're free to roam throughout the city, but unfortunately, there isn't much to see. You can't enter any buildings, drive any vehicles, and there's not really much to explore. It's kind of set up in a linear path, in which you almost feel like you're traveling through a movie set, rather than a living, breathing cityscape. The combat can be fun at times, but the aiming is definitely a bit difficult, even with its use of a lock-on feature. Despite these gripes, I still enjoyed my time with the game and was pleasantly surprised by how engaged I was after a couple hours or so. The stories of both Marcus and Jack have a unique sense of depth to them, and the gritty world of Narc is an excellent trip back to that early 2000s fascination with everything gangsta. The game also includes a pretty nice licensed soundtrack, featuring DMX, Cypress Hill, and even Leonard Skinner, which is always a plus to me, baby. The game was met with an overall unsavory reception upon its release, with most critics stating it to be stale or morally vacant. But while I can agree with them on some aspects, I still think that it's a game worth checking out just for the sake of gaming history. At the time the game was released with only a $20 price tag, and honestly, this game includes more entertainment than most of the full price AAA dog shit that we've seen in present day. So if you've ever wanted to live out your fantasies as an undercover cop with a taste for trouble, then NARC is the game for you. And while the reception of NARC was a bit mixed for its time, at least Midway was able to make it to release. Unfortunately, they weren't so lucky with the next endeavor we're here to talk about, as it was a project that never made it to completion. But for a kid like me, reading about this title in my 2005 Game Informer, I'm sad it never happened. So pour yourself a little gin and juice, as we're about to take a ride with Mr. D-O-double-G himself and John Singleton's fear and respect. Now we're going to take a little cruise back to a personal favorite year of mine in gaming. That year being 2004, of course. As we find ourselves at the Spike TV Video Game Awards ceremony, an award show that used to thrive on the excitement of the video game industry and hosted many different celebrity guests and artists. On this particular year of the ceremony, Snoop Dogg had taken to the podium to announce his involvement with an upcoming video game that would be directed by the legendary John Singleton. He invited John on stage to introduce the game to the crowd and even showed them a little bit of gameplay. It starred Snoop as the main character Goldie, a South Central native who's got some deep roots in the dangerous gang culture of LA. The trailer shows Snoop and his friends being ambushed by a rival gang, causing the vehicle he's in to lose control, resulting in Snoop having to flee on foot. 
It was a promising trailer, and coming at a time like this when GTA San Andreas and other crime related games were storming the market, it looked like a much more narrative driven title for fans of the crime genre to enjoy. The game was drawing a lot of speculation for it being another run of the mill GTA clone. But the executive producer for Midway, Scott Lane, did an interview in which he delved into the details of this game's design as well as the overall plot. He explains that the story follows Goldie, who is again played by Snoop, upon his recent release from prison on a second strike. Goldie doesn't want to go back to prison and is hoping to be able to separate himself from the street life and turn over a new leaf. Unfortunately, this won't be the case as he's sucked back into the treacherous life of a South Central gang member and finds himself on a path of revenge and redemption. In the interview, the game is described as a much more linear based Max Payne style shooter than the preconceived notion of a GTA clone. The game was also meant to be heavily story based and provide more of a deep challenge to its players, giving them a gritty and realistic approach to its story. Scott backs this up by detailing the humanity of your character, only being able to withstand a couple of bullets. Given the fragility of your character, the game was designed for more strategic gunplay and made use of a cover system and was also looking to include what seemed to be team mechanics for waging turf wars. He described the game's title as being an important piece of the game, as your fear or respect from other NPCs in the game could affect the path of your story. For example, if you were to help a character in the beginning of a game, it could benefit you later on down the line. This was an interesting concept for a game of this genre, as it wasn't an idea that was really made too popular until a game like Fable came along. But seeing a serious narrative based street game being produced by one of the greatest urban directors of all time, fear and respect seem much too good to be true. And unfortunately, it was. There aren't many details surrounding the cancellation of fear and respect, as it was silently halted around March of 2006, being the same year it was set to release. Many people speculate that Midway felt these type of games were oversaturating the market at the time and that the game wouldn't have fared well against its competitors. In 2019, Snoop had done a short interview with Cheddar Esports in which he briefly answered to why the game was cancelled. He stated that those in charge of developing the game were unable to reach the same vision that John and him had planned and eventually led to the entire project being cancelled. It was also speculated they were going to make a movie adaptation as well, but all plans of that were also cancelled. It's just crazy to think of the potential that this game had behind it, as many of the games that were saturating the market at this time really were nothing more than GTA knockoffs. But with fear and respect, this felt like a much more serious look into the dark side of LA and could have seriously immersed its players in a way that most of these games were too shallow to reach. It's well documented that Snoop was disappointed with the cancellation of this project, and I'm sure Mr. Singleton was as well, but it also left an entire generation of gamers with disappointment, as it really looked like it was going to be an amazing game. I mean, for Midway to announce the game on one of the most important nights for gaming, and even promote the game on the cover of Game Informer, it's just wild to me they wouldn't go through with it. But with most of these theories being just that, theories, it's safe to say we'll probably never know the truth of what happened. All I know is that the potential for fear and respect was definitely there, and it could have been one of the most ambitious games of its genre, but due to unforeseen circumstance and a ridiculous amount of competition at the time of its development, it seemed that the game was doomed from the very beginning. Snoop had mentioned in that same interview with Cheddar Esports that he hoped the game could eventually be made to honor John Singleton. And with that being said, I agree with you Snoop. But that's enough harping on what could have been, because the next game on our list is surprisingly one of the better titles to come out of this grit soaked era of crime gaming. So get ready for some left lane driving and plenty of polite insults in our retrospective look at the getaway on the PlayStation 2. When looking back on the origins of the getaway and how it came to be, You'll come to find that it's very interesting this game even turned out the way that it did. It all started with a PlayStation exclusive by the name of Porsche Challenge, a game that is pretty much what you would expect. It was a title in which you race against other Porsche boxsters in multiple different game modes. The director of this game, Brendan McNamara, had expressed interest in creating a free roaming game with vehicles, which eventually led to a prototype of the getaway for the PlayStation 2. The early build was eventually scrapped and Sony had decided to find inspiration in a game that was receiving critical acclaim at the time by the name of Metropolis Street Racer. This game was receiving a lot of praise due to its accurate depiction of the streets of London 
and SCE Europe had decided they were looking to one-up this title with their next build of the getaway. They initially wagered to recreate 70 square miles of London, which was going to be an incredibly daunting task. And after many technical failures and unsuccessful attempts, they decided to settle for a much more realistic 10 square miles, and recreate it as faithfully as possible. Factoring this into development had brought upon many delays in the game's release. Multiple screenshots of the game were uploaded before E3 2000 and were controversial in their detail. Many had speculated these screenshots were not an accurate representation of the game and were only mock-up photos being used to hype the project. And although a test build was being displayed in private showings, the public was far from knowledgeable on its whereabouts and development. The project had eventually exceeded its budget, leading to multiple other projects being cancelled which resulted in two different studio divisions of Sony Europe being shuttered. Ouch. It was all or nothing with this game, and the development team Soho were doing their absolute best to deliver a knockout hit. The game had finally released on December 11, 2002 in Europe, and January 19, 2003 for North America. So did it live up to the hype, or was it just a hopeless money pit for the ambitious studios at Sony Europe? Well, let's take a look. The game begins with our first of two protagonists, Mark Hammond, witnessing the murder of his wife as well as the kidnapping of his son Alex. Mark is not the one to play with, as he hurriedly jumps in his car and begins chasing those responsible through the busy streets of London. This game makes use of an invisible HUD, or lack of a HUD I should say, and uses flashing turn signals to signal which direction you are to be driving. The vehicles handle very strangely, but what I do appreciate is how heavy and realistic they feel at times. It takes a moment to get one going, and collisions feel impactful, so you've got to be sure to keep your eyes on the road when it comes to driving in this game. The chase eventually leads us to a warehouse in which we shoot our way through hordes of goons, only to be beaten over the head and eventually tied up. We wake up in a chair, in a room full of British gangsters, and eventually meet the man who's looking to make our lives a complete hell, Charlie Jolson, a man who Mark is very familiar with, and is also the head of a rival gang. Charlie has acquired Mark to do a slew of horrific crimes for him, with the threat of his son's life being taken if he doesn't do as he's told. And while Mark puts up a fight at first, he quickly learns how helpless he really is, and agrees to do his bidding. Now when this game was released, many people had speculated it to be just another GTA ripoff. And while this game shares many of the same aspects, it's very much in its own lane. The gameplay and cutscenes are much more cinematic than the majority of games were at this time, and with its use of invisible HUD and realistic gunplay, you feel like you're in the middle of a gritty crime thriller the whole way through. The city of London is beautifully recreated, and no detail is spared in its sprawling landscapes. And although it may not hold up well in today's visual standards, achieving this level of complexity in 2002 is pretty daggone impressive if you ask me. Now the narrative of this game is deep, and eventually leads to us getting to play as a detective by the name of Frank Carter in the later half of the game. Both Frank and Mark are involved with the troubles of Charlie Jolson for separate reasons, and the narrative eventually intertwines these two characters, which I always find to be an interesting way to allow the story to play out. Now I try to keep these videos spoiler free in hopes of you guys getting to try these games out if you haven't already, but all gameplay flaws aside and dated mechanics, the gameplay is an absolutely solid title. It provides much more than a free roam experience, it's more like controlling a movie, and for fans of crime thrillers and especially European media, this is the game for you. The early 2000s were laden with so many like-minded titles, just trying to capitalize on the titanic success of the GTA series. But the getaway took those very same concepts and, in my opinion, did something that still holds up in present day. So if you find yourself with nothing to do on a nice comfortable evening, maybe find yourself a copy of this game, pour yourself a pint, and get to work my friends because all I can say is, it's well worth it. But just be sure to use your turn signals. You're gonna need them. What's good, players? Ow, 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 ow. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed that video half as much as I enjoyed once again sitting in my room for 24 hours. I've been working really hard to get these videos done as fast as possible because I just, 
I have so much content in store for you guys and I can't wait to show it all to you so. But anyways, we're creeping up on 6k. Hopefully this video can push us to that point. Can't thank you guys enough for all the support you've shown me on the last video and every video I've been putting out so far this year. It's been incredible the support you guys have shown and I just can't thank you all enough. And I hope you guys are equally as excited as I am for the future of this channel. What do you think, little man? Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope to see you in the next one and stay blessed. Peace out. Little man says goodnight.